interpreting the king's dream and was highly exalted. So when you found your place, Daniel chapter number 3, stand with me if you would please, and we're going to start reading in verse number 19. Now we're going to entitle this, In the Fire with the Lord. Now you know a lot of things have already transpired from verse 1 to verse 19, and I don't really want to go back, and, but I'll try to keep you updated on where things have transgressed, where their progress from. But let's begin reading in verse number 19, and this is what the Bible said. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. That's more than normal. And he commanded the most mighty men that were uh, in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Now you think about this, just this situation. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Let's pray and ask God to help us this morning. And you pray for me as well, if you would, please. Father in heaven, how thankful we are to come to the throne of grace, to make our petitions known, and to ask you that you would speak to our hearts, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And again, I want to praise you for the wonderful Sunday school lesson. Lord, how you're always challenging us and reminding us of things that's needful in our lives. And I'm so thankful that you're speaking to us. Now I do ask that you speak to my heart now as we share this thought with the people. I pray, dear God, that you'll fill our hearts with thy word and you would challenge us in our hearts, Lord, where we need to be. So thank you for what you're going to do. Bless now this time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, and you may be seated, and thank you so much for standing. All right, we know where we're at. The men would not bow before Nebuchadnezzar's hideous-looking golden throne that he made. It was like 90 foot tall by 9 feet wide, and to him that was his God. And already, Daniel in chapter 2 has had this same situation, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a great place to in leadership positions. But the Chaldeans didn't like having the Jewish people over them. So they, like Daniel, when Daniel was praying that we, we could see in chapter 4, they're always trying to find you, make a mistake, and then we're going we're gonna to get you. And you can understand in this day and time, we're still in the same type of formats. But they were, uh, the first time the music played and the harps and all the sound went, everybody fell on their face before this statue except three Hebrew boys. Well, the Chaldeans seen it, and when they seen it, they, he, they immediately ran to the king because they knew this was kind of the king's favorite kind of boys because they were very educated and smart, and he had a lot of confidence in him. So then we get to verse 15. Let me read you this. He said, well, let's back up verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, now this is right after that the Chaldeans went to him and told what the boys were doing. And this is his response. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready, because listen, he's given them a second chance. Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music which I have made well, 
But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And watch this. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? They have no clue who, actually who they are and who they serve. Let me give you a little introduction this morning. I'm going to try my best to try to finish this in a good cordial time. One thing that binds us all together this morning is the faith that we have. And we have all problems just like everyone else. No one, because they're a Christian, is absolutely exempt from the problems of this life. We have them. But the greatest thing about the Word of God is that it teaches us how to deal with our problems because God has answers for us. But sometimes, listen, when we get in trouble, this is the last place we go for help. It's so normal to sit and either have a pity party or to go through things and wonder without going to the Word of God to find what is God doing, what is God saying, what is God's plans, what is He doing with my life at this time. So the Word of God teaches us how to deal. Now listen, the Word of God will not take away our problems. It just shows us how to deal with them. The king has constructed this ungodly image for all to bow down as soon as they heard the music. And a wise group of men called the Chaldeans who worked for the king was trying to keep all things in order for the king, but they hated the Hebrew children because King Nebuchadnezzar had set them up, these Hebrews, over the Chaldeans. So that was something that was very hard for them to deal with. So they found a way to get them back. Isn't that strange? When all the big wigs bowed down before the image of the three Hebrew boys, they stood up. So the Chaldeans ran to the king and told him exactly what they were doing, which made the king very furious. And as we read here in the verses, he was willing to give them another option. But the decree was anybody who does not bow, that very hour they are to be thrown. But the king did have a liking to them. So he basically said, look, in case you didn't understand, let me tell you the decree. So he basically said, is it true? He was so hoping they would say, oh, no, we bowed. But listen, he said, now, if you be willing when you hear the sound, well, but if you worship not, you should be cast alive into the fiery furnace. And then he said, who is the God? that will deliver you out of my hands. Their answer was very quick, and we could read the verses in verse 16 and verse 17. But this is what they said. We don't even basically have to think about it. We will not bow. They stood up to the most powerful man in the world. Now listen. Go back to me in chapter 2, verse 47, and I want to give you a little something to give you some foundation. Now, Daniel has just come through a great test with King Nebuchadnezzar revealing to him his dream and the interpretation. Now, this was the answer of the king in verse 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth, it is your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldst not reveal. So the king made Daniel a great man and gave him mighty great gifts and made him ruler over the whole providence of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all the wise men in Babylon. Now in this time, these three boys were in with Daniel because Daniel said, meet with me and let us pray that God would give me not only the interpretation, but also God's going to have to reveal to me what is the dream. Because King Nebuchadnezzar told everybody, his soothsayers, his astrologers, his magicians, no, I want you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And of course, they said, nobody can do such a thing. So thank God, these four men got together and started praying. And in one of the midnight hours, God came to Daniel and revealed to him the dream and the interpretation. So what I'm saying is, look how wonderful the king talked about the God of Daniel. 
Well, the same God of Daniel is the same God of these uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But wait a minute. Some things have literally gotten out of hand because of not bowing at this statue. Uh, quickly, an oversight of this whole chapter. Verses 1 through 3, it talks about the dedication ceremony. Verse through 4 through 7 talks about the decree that's been commanded. Verses 8 through 12, 12 talks about the devious conspiracy, you might say, of the Chaldeans. Verses 13 through 18 is the direct confrontation. And verses 19 through 30, we see the divine conservation, what God ends up doing. So this is how God gets these three great men out of a big mess. I've got three things that I want to give you this morning. Uh, number one will be the record of the deliverance. Number two will be the reason for the deliverance. And number three will be the result for their deliverance. So let's, let's look at number one. We're going to go back to verse 19 again. This is the record of their deliverance. Now listen. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed. That's pure anger, purely got his anger, got literally the best of him because they basically told the biggest man in the country, no, we will not bow. So he got, he got past being angry, and you kind of lose your mind when you get that way. And this is what he said was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it want to be heated. Now, we want to look at number one about the record of their deliverance. There is something I want to give you at least five quick thoughts on this record. Number one is the anger of the king. He commanded that they heat the furnace seven times hotter. Now listen. If you want to make these men suffer, you would not make the furnace seven times hotter. You would need to just make it hot enough to make them suffer. But because of his anger, he thought the hotter, the bigger, the better. Now watch. It was so hot that it slew the very men that had threw them in. He was so mad, he lost control. He got the strongest men he could find, and he literally heated the furnace and I remember doing a study some years back that the furnace was not like a furnace that we think it was a big open cauldron that literally was uh, heated for many purposes and for some they were absolutely killed in it but it wasn't for the very purpose that this cauldron was set now listen so they made it as hot as they could we read how they were bound with their coats with the strongest men in his army that would bind them that they could absolutely not get loose. So that was the anger of the king. Number two, the activity of the king. He commanded that they should heat this furnace seven times hotter, and this right here, he thought, would make something happen almost immediately. He wouldn't have to go through a lot. He wouldn't have to watch very much. So he thought, sure, by doing this, this would be quick, it'd be over, and it would be example to all the people that would not bow to his decree. So the activity of the king was to try to make this as hot and as bad as it can be. And then number three, there's the amazement of the king. Would you please look in verse 24? Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. Now watch this. And he said, And they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, when you and I read this, we know who the Son of God was. But to Nebuchadnezzar, he thought it was a son of one of his gods that were there because, remember, he made this huge image. So he was thinking because he did not know about this God, but 
He has obviously heard some things from Daniel about the God, as we read in chapter 2, that the God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. So he has heard. But would he recognize him as the son of God? I kind of doubt it. But when we see the words, we know exactly who this was in the midst of the fire. So the king was very amazed. And in verse 26, he was very, uh, I guess you might say he acknowledged this. Watch what it says. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and had said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Now, let me read one more verse, and I want to show you something. And the princes and governors and captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose the body of the fire had no power and was a hair, and listen, and was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed upon them. What an acknowledgement that they wasn't just saved from the fire. They were literally not affected by the fire. Now listen, the only thing that was affected by the fire were the ropes that the king had put upon them. So they were not touched, but everything the king did to bind them, those ropes, and listen how beautiful this is, the ropes were burned, but their hands were not singed. Listen, this is a hard thing to grasp, to be able to think, and as we were in Sunday school, we were talking about seeing some of these things for ourselves and how would we react. You think about it today, if we would physically see somebody thrown into a fire, and they would literally walk out unsinged, no smell, no hurt. Wow, the reaction that we would have is only God could do something of this nature. Now listen, this morning we're talking about a serious storm in the lives of these men. And it was so serious that their lives were on the very line. But in verse 25... They basically, they basically understood, excuse me, let's go back to verse 17, I'm sorry. It says, if it, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Now watch this. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The announcement to the king was made without prayer, without thought, without pondering, without considering. Hey, let's huddle together. Let's think this out. Let's... Do you see how quick it was? As soon as he, they heard it, he said, hey, we're not going to have to pray about this. We don't even need to talk to God about this. Because we know that our God is able to deliver us. But if he don't. Because you know there's no doubt that I was thinking brother Tom about these young boys. That they were probably thinking and this is a little smithology. That they were probably thinking you know God's probably got a plan A and a plan B. And if we get thrown in there I guess it's going to be plan B. Because we really thought that he would save us from it. But God is showing even the church and Christians today. God's not saving you from your problems. He's saving, you, he's saving you in them and through them. God don't have to keep everything from happening to us because if, they, if he did, then many of the lost people would say, I notice you're never under any hurt or problems or storms. I want to be a Christian too. But they would want to be a Christian because of the lack of problems associated with the Christian life. But wait a minute. If they want to see the good of the good, just tell them to hang on and wait till we get home. Get in the boat. Make sure you're born again. And when we get to the other side, you're absolutely going to absolutely love it. Now, number one was the record of their deliverance. Number two, the reason for their deliverance. And I want to show you three things uh, about their deliverance. Number one was their absolute commitment to God. 
And listen, as I just got through reading these verses, I want you to understand that in order to over overcome our trials, we're going to have to have absolute obedience to God and to His Word. They said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. I mean, they automatically know where they're going if they say the wrong thing. But because of their absolute commitment to God, this means that we don't need to discuss it, we don't need to pray about it. We already know where we're headed, and all we can say is, I hope God will do something on our behalf, but if he don't, then so be it. Now listen, I remember in Joshua chapter 24, and verse 15, he made this statement, as far as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the type of commitment that God is looking for. And he's showing us through all these biblical examples that if we just are steadfast, and if we do what Ephesians said, just stand, don't back up, don't sit down, don't throw in the towel, don't give up, then God will absolutely take care of us like he has everybody in the past. Now listen, God said I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. So God is not going to take care of these Old Testament saints, these New Testament saints, and let us go. Now, the only ones that he won't help are those that he don't know. Amen? If they're not his children, I'm sorry, he's not under, under any obligation to save them from all the mighty storms. So also, think about this this morning, they had absolute confidence in God. Verse 17, they said... Our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He said, we know that God is able to take care of this situation. Now, wait a minute. They knew God's will might be different from theirs. But they did not make up their own mind. They stuck with their obedience and the contingent upon God that he would come through for them no matter what the situation was. So, so many times we ask ourselves, God, will you deliver me? Will you help me? Will you come on the scene at the time that I need you? Sometimes we have to listen to let the Lord get us out of a mess that we have made. And I'll basically say, God says, I will be there if you patiently wait. Now, we might not be delivered at the time that we think is absolutely right for us. So they also, number three, they had absolute courage toward God. Look in verse number 18. It says, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. In the first two chapters of Daniel, he had a similar situation where he was asked, uh, uh, as they were pulled by one of the king's chambermen to be able to get them ready for service, he was going to keep them aside for three years and feed them with the king's meat and all the king's food. But da Daniel refused to do that. So when God gives us something that is hard to do, there's always going to be a list of reasons for us to uh, not to do it. Look at the situation for the Hebrew children. Number one, Daniel was out of town. Number two, they didn't think that God wanted them to give up their job that he had set them in. And number three, they were in a great situation to move up in the palace and become even at a higher place. But listen, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, said, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. They had an absolute thought to think about what is our decision and what will be the outcome. And they probably even thought in their mind, where is Daniel when we need him? He had such a great work before the king, but he comes to the place where now they're going to be challenged on their own. It's good to have somebody to depend on. It's good to have somebody there for prayer, for help, for encouragement. But wait a minute. Now they're on their own. They have to make up their own mind, their own decisions. They didn't say, Daniel, what we should do in this situation. So they had some training, and all they could do is... When everybody bows, we won't do it. We won't do it. We know there's a penalty that will be paid, but we just can't bow. So number three, the result of the deliverance. Why were they delivered? We can think of so many wonderful aspects of what God was doing. 
He could have, now listen, if you've ever read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you're going to find out thousands of people were killed, stabbed, burned at the stake, and nobody that I read in the Fox's Book of Martyrs was delivered from. Okay? And you think about it, because this happened in the early 13, 1400s, and I was so hoping to be able to read where God came on the scene and the fire wouldn't burn. Remember John when he was burned and uh, had oil poured on him and they really tried to kill him and he couldn't be. So they put him on the Isle of Patmos basically to die of an old age. But I've read that in the book that many of them that absolutely died, not one did I read in the book that said, okay, okay, I stop, I give up. I denounce Jesus Christ as my Savior. Not one did that. And I'm talking about it's horrendous in the sufferings that they did. And I've read that in thought. Dear God in heaven, you've done mighty, wonderful works in the, in the Bible. And all these people that died in the midst of fires, I remember one particular story that always stands out in my mind. There were three preachers that were fixing to be burned at the stake. And they got all the wood ready and tied them to the stake, uh, literally back to back, kind of like in a triangle. And here they are ready to get everything ready for the fire. They were given one more opportunity to literally uh, re denounce Jesus Christ and make things ready that they could get off the pile. Well, their time of discussion only said this. We know that there is living grace, and I believe there's dying grace. So what we want to do, whoever can, let the other know that everything is okay. So they started the fire. These men stood bound with their feet in their hands, and as the fire began to come up to them, they started singing Amazing Grace. The fire had already started coming up their legs, and as the fire, they still remembered their promise, hey, if anybody has something from God, let him signify to some degree. Well, the only way they could signify was when the ropes were burned, their hands were literally completely gone. One of them started raising their hand and said, to God be the glory, and the other started singing and shouting loud. So the people that were doing this we're absolutely confused. How could you be singing in the midst of a fire? So God didn't deliver them from, but he did give them dying grace in the middle. I got to thinking about how serious a matter that would be. We hope and pray in our day and time that we never have to come to such a serious problem. But listen, these enemies that tied them, they were absolutely executed. The soldiers fell down on the outside of the fire, and the Hebrew boys fell down inside of the fire, but they were unharmed. The enemies who took them up to kill them were killed themselves. It was quite often when God puts us in the furnace of fire or difficult trials, we think of it as worse things could happen to us. How much worse could it get? And maybe our enemies are even fanning the flames in the process of fire, but God knows how to take care of our enemies as well. Their bonds were eliminated, verse 21 and 23. These men were bound, in verse 25 we read, he answered and said, I see four men loosed. They were not bound anymore. The only thing that was bound was the ropes that was put on them by the men. So it was the very fire that had set them free from their bonds. Their hearts were encouraged. Now listen, in the Old Testament we find a lot of applications of the Lord, which we call the theophany. That's God manifested in some way, in some form. Moses saw the Lord in a burning bush for the delivery of, of Israel and their enemies. Elijah, when the Lord appeared to him, it was in a small, still voice. Like the disciples on the water, which we looked at this morning, Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm. Like two on the road to Emmaus who were sad and discouraged, Jesus, the very Lord, came to them and talked to them and opened unto them the scripture which they knew not. 
Like Deacon Stephen, beaten down with stones, lying down in dust, bleeding, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Like the Apostle Paul, very discouraged at Corinth, Jesus said, lift up your spirit and be of good cheer, preach the gospel, for I have many people in this city. So you and I can remember the times where God has came down to us in a form of an answered prayer or somewhere to comfort our heart and to help us in troublesome times. He came down to Noah. He came down and had lunch with Abraham. He came down and wrestled with Jacob. Jacob lost on that little ordeal, had a problem with his thigh for the rest of his life. He came down and manifested himself to Moses as he led the children of Israel on the building of the tabernacle. Boy, God is so good. And then he came to poor Gideon that Gideon says, I'm just, I'm not the man, I can't do it. Gideon asked him a couple of prayer requests and God mightily answered. He came down to guide Israel through the entire 40-year wilderness and he came down to defend Israel as the captain of the Lord's host. He came down and delivered Daniel from the lion's den. He came down and delivered these three Hebrew children we just talked about. He came down and was born in a stable in a cradle in a manger. God manifested himself in flesh, the condescending of Christ. He is the God who comes down for us in our trials and in our test. He's always faithful. Maybe some of us feel like we're in hot fires. Maybe we think that our storms are bigger than storms we've ever had before. But I want to tell you something. God knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. And he's there to just knock at your door and give you comfort and peace. And I want to tell you something. In my 35 years, I've never said this statement. Where were you when I needed you? I've never had to say that. Why? Because my God is faithful. He always comes through. Now, do I always get what I want? No. But I get exactly what God wants for my life. And he is so pleased to work through us if we listen. And let me, let me give you this last one. Their influence was so enlarged. Look at verse number 30, I believe it is. Then the king promoted Shagrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Why? Because they just proved to this king there was a God in heaven, and there was a God who watched over the children, and there was a God that delivers. And listen, I hope today, listen, I hope today when we go through storms, we go through trials, I hope the lost people that are around us say, you don't seem to fret. You don't seem to worry. You don't seem to complain. I've heard how much trouble things are happening, but you seem to just, you seem to be so cool in your demeanor. And then we can say, well, it's God that fights our battles. The battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. He's the one that delivers. And I hope our testimony says, but if he does not, but if he does not deliver me from this, he will help me in this. I will know what to say and what to do because, listen, storms, trials, and tests will come. If you've never had a storm or a trial, pray this prayer. Lord, give me patience. And when you pray this, God will teach you exactly how to have patience. And I'm going to tell you something. I gave this thought to one lady. She came to me and said, Preacher, I have no patience for nothing, for people, even for myself. I'm, I'm so discouraged. I get so angry. I have no patience. What can I do? I said, well, I've got a verse of Scripture for you. The Bible said we have not because we ask not, so why don't you ask God to give you patience? She said, thank you very much. And about a week she came back. She wasn't thanking me for anything. She was very strong in her language, in her words, and she said, my God, what did you put upon me? I said, I did nothing. But I said, would you care to share? She said, no, I'd have to write a book. So I understood that things were going awry, one after another after another, and I said, have you learned anything through this week? And her answer was, 
oh, yes, I have learned tremendously. And I said, would you share it with me? She said, yes, I'll never pray for patience again. And I said, well, you can learn, but you know how patients come because if you're never tested and you never have any storms, you never have any trials, you'll never learn what it is to be patient. We will lose it at all times. Listen, I want to close with this this morning. God has something for all of us. None of us are privy to being freed from any heartaches, any problems. I wish we were, but we're not. But listen, we are kept by the power of God through faith. And salvation is ready to all those that know not God. Salvation is always ready. But I must give you this. Trials and tests are beneficial. They're helpful. Sister Reba, you have been one of the, through one of the greatest trials and tests that I've seen in a long time. And our God has came to you and said, I've got this. Don't you worry. And I believe he already told you. Because you told me a week ago or two weeks ago, you already knew. And listen, God spoke to her heart, probably put his arms around her and said, Dear honey, I have got you. I've got you comforted. It ain't time for you to leave this world. I've got you, and you're going to be a great testimony for me in the future. And how many wonderful times do we hear about God literally delivering people from so... I know a preacher that was literally had four stage, the fourth stage of liver cancer. Now listen, if you know anything about that, that's the end of your life. That's absolutely the end. And he said... Instead of preparing to leave this world, he said, being a pastor, I had my church. Pray God's will be done. It might be time for me to go. God could replace me. He said, but as I was laying in the hospital, looking up, sick, sick, sick from all the chemicals. And he was saying, well, if I'm going to die, why do I have to die with the sickness of these chemicals? Because they're literally making my life, making me wish that I was already dead. And he said, and I did think, dear God, why don't you just kill me and take me home? And he said, one night while he was laying in the bed praying, God said, what do you think that I ought to do? And he said, I literally felt like I heard that. And he said, my first thought was, I want to be healed. But he said, I remember what Solomon said when God gave him a thought. And he said, whatever you want, I'll be just as happy to stay as I will to go. You choose for me. And he said, this overwhelming peace came over me. And he said, and then I knew I was going to be okay. No doctor told me that. He said, I just knew by the touch of God that gave me from the sickness and the nervousness. And I believe he even said that he told the doctors, no more chemicals, no more radiation, no more nothing. I just want to trust the Lord on this. And they said, against our judgments, we don't think you should do that. And as he's standing behind a pulpit, and it's been 15 years, and he was healed of something, the doctor said, there's no cure. You're at the fourth stage. You are within a week of dying. Your kidney, your liver is shutting down. Now listen, there are no liver transplants. But he said, I just decided to believe God over the doctors. And I told God, I'm happy with whichever way you go. Take me home or leave me. I'm happy. And he said, 15 years later, I'm still here. And now I'll tell it for a testimony and also a testimony to my church praying for me that God would help. And he says, and without that storm, without that trial, without that storm, without all the troubles that were afforded me, I don't think I would have appreciated the grace of God like I do now. Let's stand to our feet if you would, please. Heavenly Father, we all have went through circumstances, situations. Sometimes we call them storms, trials, or just problems. Or there just seems to be so many things going wrong. And I know you could be trying to get my attention about something that I need to do or change, change my direction. 
But I know they're there for my benefit. For Romans 8, 28 tells us all things work together for good to them that love God. Lord, we believe that, but it's so hard to quote that verse when all the world seems to be falling in on us. How can we possibly have good out of our suffering? This is the time when God shows himself the greatest, when our faith is literally tested. As we look this morning about these men in the boat, Jesus said, O ye of little faith, and another time, where is your faith? And why is it that you have no faith? Oh, dear God, without that storm in the boat, they would have never knew about their faith. So, Father, as our life progress, I pray that as these things approach us in our heart, in our body, and in our spirit, we pray, oh, God, in Jesus' name, that you will teach us how to trust you how to believe in you, and to have the faith that it takes to make our stand and to trust you all the days of our life, when we're on the mountain and when we're in the valley. Oh, God in heaven, deliver us by your sweet spirit. For these things we pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's all.